We're back here on the platform and uh, discussing uh, what is happening at Bamsi in North Andros. And um, Dr. Uh, Omar Thomas wants us to know that um, the trees are already bearing, eh? Uh, yes, at in, in, in North Andros. But Dr. Crane, Dr. Jonathan Crane, uh, at the break, um, Dr. Evans was talking about quality and food security and uh, making the point uh, that farmers need to come up to scratch. Eh? Um, tell us, how, 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 how is that done? How do we get best practices mm -hmm. um, in a society where, where people have been uh, farming in a particular way for hundreds of years, well, at least a hundred years. Right. Well, my idea with, with the institution, BAMSI, is that they're actually doing two approaches. One is an extension, education, and outreach program with the current producers mm -hmm. and to modernize and to help them mm -hmm. through training, through demonstrations, on hand, uh, hands-on demonstrations at the Institute. Um, and, and extension, and by that I mean not just publications, but workshops, seminars, meetings, hands-on demonstrations with the current producers. At the same time, they're going to be taking on a new uh, generation of potential entrepreneurs and agriculturists uh, and natural resource people. And so hopefully you're going to see two things move forward at the same time. And really, it, 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 and Dr. Evans uh, is correct, is that agriculture now is really, really science-based. Um, and it has to be sustainable. And that means it has to be very collaborative among natural resource concerns, uh, socioeconomic concerns, and also just the science and, and art of growing, uh, whether it's forest products or fruits and vegetables or ornamentals. So, okay. it, it, and, but really, the, the training with the current growers, it would be, you know, offering them workshops, offering them training in the more modern procedures uh, and concepts. Um, and that's why I think the demonstrations are so important because, you know, they're already out in the field. Okay. But, but, uh, but tell the, uh, the farmer in Cat Island who, who's been farming for papayas for uh, a, a long time, um, what, what would make him more... Uh, productive. Mm -hmm. What are you offering um, that would make his farm more productive than, say, what you are doing at Bamsi? Because he looks at a papaya tree as being a papaya tree. <laughs> well, just just uh, from an extension point of view. Yes. We visited several growers in the past few days, and just uh, one of the things that is part of extension is outreach, and that means the extensionist going to the field, visiting, and getting to know the grower. And first thing is listening to the grower, what they have to say, mm -hmm. but also looking at the same time as what is actually happening. And so I if they say, well, you know, I'm having this problem uh, I with papaya, we'll take that as an example. Simple thing is that if the papaya producer on Cat Island is putting in a new planting, yet he or she has left the old planting and the old planting is infected with a virus, First thing I would do is I, I would counsel them that the reason that they're not being as successful as they could be is that before they put in the new planting, they need to completely remove and destroy the old planting. Why? If you leave the old plants and you put in the new ones, the virus can be transferred by aphids directly to the young plants, which drastically reduces their lifespan and their productivity and the quality of the fruit. Mm -hmm. So it, just simple things, and, and so you know, getting the trust with the grower, um, making appropriate suggestions, not saying, well, you know, you need to buy a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment to do that. No, what do you have available? What are the strategies you could do now that are going to enhance your production now and in, in the short term future? So there is a one on one component, not just classroom teaching, not just mass teaching. Farming is expensive business, isn't it? It is. And um, the way thousands of farmers in the Bahamas have been growing their, their products, um, they, they, they do not comport really uh, with the scientific uh, way that 
that you, you were talking about, Dr. Cray. Right. Let us uh, use a scientific yes? way because the, the, art of, the art of what they're doing was driven by science for what it was at that time. What it was at that time. At that time. Right. You see, the <laughs> farmer in Cat Island, for instance, who has been growing uh, tomatoes for 50 years, mm -hmm. He is used to growing it a particular way. Yes. Uh, you are saying to him that his yield would be ver um, uh, higher, his quality would be better if he does it scientifically. Is you that what you learn techniques, you modern methods? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's like coming in and saying, no, you're doing this all wrong. <laughs> not at all. In fact, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is not listening and seeing what they're currently doing that's right. You just don't go in and say, no, this is wrong, that's wrong, you need to change everything. They're probably doing 95% of what they're doing is already right. It's already correct. It's tweaking where they have an issue. So if there's an insect or a disease pressure mm -hmm. or if there's a fertilizer technique that you could say, you know, if you try this, and we're not saying go in and spend $15,000 and do this right away. Let's just do a little simple demonstration and see if this would work out for you. And so that's why, again, why I think the demonstration plots are mm -hmm. so key, because people see that, and, and, and you can compare and see. But it wouldn't be, I, I, would, I would tell you that I think the farmers are probably doing uh, a good bit, if not 90%. They're already good. It's just going in and assisting to tweak, to move, to move forward. Yeah. I, I want to just follow up there, if, if, if I may, mm -hmm. you know, by giving a further example to what um, Dr. Crane has said. And it's like, as I said, there are new technologies, yeah. new products that are becoming available, which helps agriculture to be more in unison, environmentally friendly. For example, um, what we have found is that there's a new set of fertilizer, which is known as smart fertilizer. And simple, what it means is giving the plants the nutrients that it needs at the time when it needs it, so that you don't put on an excess amount of fertilizer and, and waste. Broadcasting. Because that, as far I mean, my area is really cost of production, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the economics. And as again, as I said, you're operating in a competitive environment, so you mm -hmm. can't afford to run your costs. You have to see how, what you can do to, you know, save on your costs, mm -hmm. right? So if you can use a fertilizer, which the farmer might not know is available, and through your extension and your outreach program, you can tell him of this new technology that if you use this slow release fertilizer, it's going to release the fertilizer so that the plant could more utilize it and less of it would probably waste and you probably not spend. Mm -hmm. That is a technology. It's not just that he does know what he's doing before, but he might not be aware of this particular. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Professor Evans, uh, you, you're with the... Um, University of Florida, but you're a Caribbean man, aren't you? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes, um, yes. Grew yes. in the Caribbean? Yes, yes, I tell uh, you a little. <laughs> uh, uh, and um, my question to you is, is this. Um, there are people in the Bahamas and other places in the region who believe that um, if farmers in the Bahamas uh, are going to be successful, that the cost of the production must be at uh, such a, 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 a standard or rate that they are able to compete with the farmers in the United States, in Florida. Right now, we are importing a whole lot of produce out of Florida. Uh, let's talk about the competitiveness um, given the different markets and um, costs of different markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, I, I will start off with that. And, 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 and that is important um, because the world today is a global village. Yes. And so um, the competition, prices, people are looking around and looking um, to, to stretch their dollar to see. But sometimes it's a myth to, to say that our farmers might not be able to produce at a price that they can compete even with the Im imported product. It is true that today the, the number that is being thrown around and what I heard is that we are importing, I mean the Bahamas is importing one billion dollars worth of food. But again it comes back to the science and the, the assistance and the advice and outreaching 
we believe that, I mean, if farmers get the proper technology and proper training and reduce some of the waste, right, that it's possible that they can compete at least to a reasonable level with the imported food, right? There is a lot of waste that takes place in the Caribbean because proper post harvesting techniques are, are not put in place and a lot of waste take place, you know, spoilage because it's not maybe chilled as soon as mm -hmm. it is harvested or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So it increases the, the overall cost. So they have to sell it at a fairly high, high price. But I think that, I mean, our farmers and our growers, you know, can in, in, in some cases. Um, yeah, in a lot of cases they, they compete right. well. Compete well. Yes. W what happens though, you know, and it is, I, without any offense to my American colleagues, <laughs> a lot of things that are sold here at lower prices are not necessarily A1 quality. And that's why they appear to be so low in price here. Because I'm sure I can tell you that when we come out of Bamsi with our papaya and our banana, we would be able to compete on the international market outside of the Bahamas effectively because we'll be sending the same quality that other people outside are accustomed to. And those qualities may be better than the ones that are presently on our supermarket shelves here. Mm. So it is a myth to say that we in the Caribbean cannot produce competitively. I understand, though, that the economy of scale determines some prices. But in most instances, in some of the exotic fruits and so, I don't see why we can't compete anywhere else. We have been. We have exported to the United States. We have exported to the UK. We have exported to Canada. And we compete well in the market. Hmm. Well, let, let's talk about the aesthetics as well of whatever you are producing. Um, just to look, um, because, you know, some people believe that if it comes from uh, North America, uh, the quality uh, and the, the look, the presentation um, is, is, is more appealing. I, let me tell you something. I'm going to say this. I don't normally say it publicly. But it was a disgrace and a shame that we produced papaya in Jamaica some years ago. I was one of the papaya exporters. And we export our papaya to the United States and Florida. And those papayas are imported back to Jamaica by some of the hoteliers. Imported back? back yes, that's yes. correct, to put on their, on, on, on their tables. You, you, you might have to have that same um, thing happening in the Bahamas. Well, we're trying not to have uh, that type of... That you, that you will have your papaya sent to Miami. And then the other people bring it back. Bring it back to, 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 to Nassau in order for it to be acceptable to the hotels. But you others. see, we're going to have our brand, Bamsi brand. That's a symbol of quality. That Bamsi sticker that will be on our fruit and our vegetables will be a symbol of quality. Mm. And we're expecting that that symbol of quality will be respected in any of the market our produce are sold, whether it's the United States, in Canada, the United Kingdom, or in Nassau. Interesting. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and, and, and citrus, are uh, you going to be producing uh, in, 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 a, in an abundance? I, I, yeah, we're I, producing I limes. Limes. Yes. Well. Um, you would have a ready market here for limes, eh? Well, we hope. <laughs> and we, be we believe that um, the limes would be consumed as fast as they come from the farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the amount that we will we'll be having would represent only about 15% of the demand. Yes. Um, Dr. Crane, you talked about the, the quality of soil being the same as, as Florida. Is right. that, is that yes, very it? similar. They're both uh, a, a limestone-based soil, very high in calcium carbonate, mm -hmm. very high pH. Actually, your soil's somewhat better because you actually have a topsoil layer that can be you know, shallow to two feet deep, whereas ours is usually less than a couple of inches. And so very similar methods 
are used, uh, could be used here for overcoming nutrient deficiencies, for managing the irrigation uh, regime, which by the way, also when you manage your irrigation, you're also managing your fertilizer because you're not pushing it below the root, the effective root zone. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's so many similarities um, and in fact, you guys have some advantages in, in the fact that you don't really have a, we get much colder. In fact, we can, even in Dade County, can freeze. Whereas here, you don't have to worry about that. So this gives you advantages in, you can grow some crops that we cannot grow because it's too cold. Um, and also, you have the advantage that you could cycle some crops and actually get multiple crops in the same year. And so th you definitely, and you have uh, the potential during the dry season to control the water to the plant, which again can be used to manipulate the plant to cause off-season flowering and fruiting. So there's a lot of, 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 lot of potential uh, in the crops you can grow, uh, both fruits and vegetables and ornamentals, mm -hmm. mm. Um, and in the way you can grow them. So. Uh, yeah, the, the environmental conditions, we, we were quite impressed. I mean, we had read and I was aware that, you know, the soils and things like that, but to come and actually see the fields, see the land, uh, see where the water table is, you know, all of that just confirmed um, what, we, what we had thought or read. So it was a great experience to get to go out in the field mm -hmm. and actually see this um, in fact, they had a hard time getting us back out of the field because yeah, it was just like <laughs> take off and we were, you know, talking to the grower and looking at this and looking at that. So, so you, you, you were suggesting that um, we were sitting on a potential or sitting on, uh, on, on money that um, could have been produced a long time ago. Well, there, it's, uh, there's a lot of potential there. A lot of potential. A lot of potential. And, and I think one of the advantages you have here is that you can learn from our mistakes because along our long history in South, you know, South Florida, we've of course made mistakes. And so you guys have the, the challenge but also the opportunity mm -hmm. to manage this, both your natural resources, the forest resources, the ecosystem, and the agriculture in such a way that you don't have to go back and try to correct mistakes you yeah. can do it right the first time you, you you're an associate professor in in, in tropical fruits and and um, in in abaco uh, some time ago some years ago there was a huge citrus farm a uh, tremendous amount of grapefruits uh, were produced um, in in abaco I believe mr. Enos probably told you that yes uh, the um, farm was diseased uh, with a canker mm. um, isn't that a threat uh, in this part of the world, yes. uh, in climates such as ours? Yeah. And how do we guard against uh, uh, such things happening? Because a farmer can, you can lose a tremendous amount of money uh, by, by his, his crop being diseased. Citrus is going to be, I, you, uh, yeah, citrus is going to be a challenge. There's no question about it. Um, and in Florida, I don't know if you know what's happening in Florida, but we have uh, lost, you know, close to 400,000 acres out of, um, the, you know, we used to have like 900,000 acres. Mm -hmm. Citrus canker came in, they, we lost about, you know, 200,000 acres. Citrus greening has come in, we've lost uh, another 250,000, so we've got like 500,000 acres. And so citrus greening is going to be a big challenge, and you're going to have to select which citrus you grow, because some, some citrus species get killed. Yeah. The limes seem to have quite a bit of tolerance. In fact, we've been, we've been uh, uh, growing some limes and, and experimenting with the limes and, and are, are pleased and surprised mm -hmm. at, at how tolerant they are. But so there's, there's been a reduction in lime production uh, in the Bahamas in recent times, eh? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, because some of the trees uh, were diseased? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, if you have citrus greening or citrus canker, uh, the management has to change. Otherwise, it, it, and this is, might be, you know, modernization of, of the practices for citrus mm -hmm. because uh, that is a totally new ball game uh, in the Western Hemisphere where citrus greening is, is taken what, hold. What, what, what has brought this about? 
Well, it's uh, an inter inadvertent introduction of these bacterial pathogens, which are then uh, easily spread. In the case of citrus greening, it's spread, spread, spread by a, um, um, a psyllid, which is an insect, which can transmit the disease from an infected plant to a healthy plant. Uh, in the case of citrus canker, that is actually spread by wind-driven rainfall. So just when you have the mist with the rain, it can, it can spread the bacteria from one plant to another. Also, it can be mechanically spread. Very, very difficult uh, to control, you know, that kind of spread. Mm. So, you know, in Florida right now, there is a tremendous research effort. I'm talking, um, you're looking at probably close to 7,500 scientists focused on trying to find solutions to citrus greening. Mm -hmm. um, and hundreds of millions of dollars, both USDA and the University of Florida, University of California, a number of universities, um, to try to determine methods for controlling the psyllids, methods for controlling uh, the, the citrus greening bacteria. And, you know, they're making progress. Of course, everything is slower than you would like, but uh, as, an, as an example, the, the, the university has now uh, released uh, several rootstocks that may enhance uh, the tree tolerance of the disease, things like that. So these things take time. I, we wish they didn't take as much time, but I think if anybody's going to figure out how to grow citrus with in the presence of these diseases, it's going to be uh, University of Florida in conjunction with its collaborators. But it's going to take time. Well, hopefully, BAMC will play mm -hmm. a yeah, role. Yeah, with his collaborators. So yes. BAMC is one of the collaborators. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have to take another break here, and uh, we are uh, continuing to talk about Bamsi uh, in North Andrews. We take this break, we'll come right back. Okay, so, so Dr. Dillon.